I've tried to record this so many times. This is like take 40. This is the one that's gonna go online and that's that. <laughs> Hi, my name's Karishma. I'm one of the co-founders of Keyline. Um, and this is the first episode of a new series in which I'll be reading and discussing extracts of text that I think are politically relevant and are useful for understanding how oppressive structures of power function and um, potential means of dismantling them. Before I go on, I think it's important to give a content warning. So um, I'll be talking about sexual violence and police violence. If these are triggering topics for you, please feel free to click off now if you need to. Okay, so the first text that I've chosen to read from is called Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power by Lola Olafemi. This is what it looks like. It's really beautiful. Um, I've been really enjoying this because it articulates some of the issues that I found with mainstream feminism so well. One of them being that it leaves behind women of colour, particularly those who are black, Muslim, trans. It's just so exclusionary. Um, and in the extract that I'm about to read, Olifemi exposes the role of the state in perpetrating violence against women um, through the prison system and the police. Um, I think this is really relevant right now, obviously because of the response to the death of George Floyd at the hands of the police in America. Um, but it is important to remember that these structures of power are also existing in the UK and um, this book illustrates that really well, I think. So let's get on to it. Um, the chapter that I'm going to be reading from is called The Sexist State and I'll be reading the subheadings Yarswood and Women's Detention and State Killings. Yarlswood IRC is a fully contained residential centre housing adult women and adult family groups awaiting immigration clearance. We focus on decency and respect in all as aspects of our care for our residents. We deliver our service based on a community model allowing residents as much freedom of movement and choice as possible. This is the opening paragraph of the Yarlswood website, accompanied by images of smiling women alongside their families. Open in 2007 by a Labour government, this centre acts as a detention facility for those awaiting deportation. Often, women can be held there for indeterminate periods of time while they fight against their removal from the country. Most, if not all of the women in detention are working class black women and women of colour seeking asylum. They are locked in, unable to leave and subjected to surveillance by outsourced security guards. Tucked away in Bedford, outside of the public consciousness, it's hard to think of a more potent example of state violence. Yarlswood is one of eight detention centres across the country. Behind the promise of care and respect lay the horrors experienced by women in detention. We women here in Yarlswood did not anticipate our freedom would be taken from us or the impact it would have. We are on a hunger strike because we are suffering unfair imprisonment, imprisonment and racist abuse in this archaic institution in Britain. This is a desperate measure due to desperate circumstances. We feel voiceless, forgotten and ignored. This extract from a joint statement released on the 8th of March 2018 by women detained in Yarlswood illustrates their desperation. They used the statement to emphasise that, while celebrating women's suffrage, anyone who cares about justice should remain cognisant of the fact that women's rights are still under attack in the UK. A dossier published in 2015 by Women Against Rape and Black Women's Rape Action Project found gross sexual abuse and mistreatment in Yarlswood is commonplace. Women are subjected to sexual violence at the hands of guards and are often powerless to fight back. Yarlswood represents everything the state would like us to forget about the way it carries out its business. It is the counter argument to a government that claims to be committed to women's rights. Yet mainstream feminism has been curiously silent about these gross injustices. When the state enacts violence on women of colour, black women migrants especially, this silence speaks volumes. Aside from the racism inherent in mainstream feminism, 
One of the main reasons for this silence is that demanding an end to deportation and detention means moving beyond a liberal idea that protecting borders is a reasonable concern. Mainstream feminism, infected by a neoliberal policy agenda, does not possess the political will or the capacity to make such demands. State killings. Dorothy Gross was shot dead by police as they searched for another suspect in 1985. Cynthia Jarrett died from heart failure during a police search of her home in 1985. In 1993, Joy Gardner died after police descended on her house and restrained her until she stopped breathing. They had come to deport her back to the West Indies because her visa had lapsed. Sarah Reed died on 11th January 2016 from, from self-strangulation in Holloway Prison after prison guards and psychiatric nurses ignored her deteriorating mental state. In 2017, Annabelle Landsberg died in a segregation cell in HMB, HMP Peterborough after being left there for 21 hours. She was diabetic and su suffered from physical and mental health problems. The list reaches far back in time and will continue into the future as long as our politics does nothing to oppose the most violent elements of the state. These are just a few examples of state killings that occurred as a result of coming into contact with police or the prison system, and they reveal a pattern. All were black women. In the liberal feminist rationale, the police and prisons are necessary because they protect women from danger. They are necessary because without them society would descend into chaos. But is the world not already chaotic for the black people who die in custody or are deported in the dead of night? It is not already a dystopian nightmare for the undocumented migrants and the women and their families who burn to death in Grenfell Tower as a, as a direct result of state negligence, or those unjustly deported to their deaths in the Windrush scandal. If black women die disproportionately at the hands of the police, historically and in the present moment, we must ask, what is the purpose of the police and detention system? Is it right that some women must die so that others are protected? Do we wish to be the recipients of that kind of protection? When we understand race and gender as inseparable, there is no feminist case for the existence of the police. The police are deployed to do the state's bidding and are enmeshed in the oppressive consequences of this task. This is why, despite liberal feminism's insistence, increased numbers of women entering the police force Force can never transform its practice. State killings act as another mechanism to remove women from public life. The state expresses itself through the use of violence. It then rationalises women's death, deaths through inquest and apology. Coming to terms with this can shake the very foundation of what we have been taught about police and the court system being vehicles for justice. But what might a feminist feminist response to state violence look like, and why is it important to craft one? So over the next few pages, Ola Femi um, details the work of a feminist direct action group called Sisters Uncut, who um, focus on community organising, and um, she ends the chapter by concluding that Collective organising is one antidote to state violence. Um, she writes, Collective responses remind us that as much as it benefits the state to de-link and isolate us, we need each other to survive. In order to build a world that is worth living, we need to face up to the realities of the state's actions. Starting with changes in local communities, defend defending shelters, youth centres, organising against gentrification, helps lay the groundwork for for making cross-country and eventual transnational demands. A commitment to disrupting the state's violence when and where we see it takes feminism outside of the realm of words and theories and makes it a living, breathing set of principles. It reminds us that where we can make interventions, we should, and that only work that seeks to shake and unsettle the very foundations of the sexist state is feminist work. Um, that's all for today. Um, this is such a well-researched and accessible book. Um, I'd really recommend uh, that you go grab yourself a copy. It's currently £5 on the Pluto Press website, I think. 
so definitely check that out um i hope you enjoyed that uh thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next week